The founder and chief executive of one of the first online trading platforms tells me what he really thinks about the boom in DIY investment. You have to separate out some things from investing and gambling. I don't think the cryptocurrency could ever be a fiat currency. I mean, ESG investing um, is really a lifestyle choice. What you should do is focus on the underlying product you want to trade and then choose your wrapper, your settlement wrapper. I'm not some fuzzy politician that's trying to say the right thing at the right time to the right people and win votes. This is the real world. It's Friday the 27th of October and you're watching Markets with Madison. Lord Peter Crudus is a billionaire, member of the UK's House of Lords, Brexiteer and founder and chief executive of online trading platform CMC Markets. He founded his firm, which is listed on the London Stock Exchange, in 1989. He's considered one of the pioneers of making trading available to the masses. But a lot has changed, with technology enabling more solutions than ever for investors. I sat down with Peter while he was in Auckland last week to ask him what he thinks investors want and what they should or shouldn't be trading. You effectively, in 1989, when you created CMC, you, yeah. from then, effectively democratised investing. Yeah. I'd love to know what you think of the boom in accessible investing, what we call DIY investment platforms. Yeah. There's yeah. so many of them now. What do you think when you see the prevalence of the number of them out there? The internet, you know, allowed um, people access to the world's financial markets. And the analogy I use, I, when I launched the internet and we loaded shares and stuff like that, I, I would say it's something like, it's now possible for a taxi driver, an ordinary man in the street, like my brothers, to pull over to the side of the road, trade any one of 10,000 global markets from their mobile phone and get the same price as Goldman Sachs. I mean, how powerful is that? Because the internet brings you transparency and scale. We can process a trade, whether it's 100 shares or a billion, you know, billion dollar transaction for the same price. Bosh, 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 it all goes through electronically, goes through to the clearer. Happy day. And there's numerous platforms that they can do that through, right? And because yeah, there's so many, <laughs> this is what I was going to ask you. I mean, there's been this proliferation of platforms. Mm -hmm. What do you think will determine who survives and who doesn't? Because they can't all survive. We've already started to see some consolidation of platforms. It's a very good question. And that question probably would get answered differently every year for the last sort of five, six, seven, eight years. I think the differentiator now is the capability to be able to make pricing in financial products. You see, if you wanted to offer, offer Aussie shares or UK shares or US shares, you would probably go on exchange and transact through an exchange. But just imagine if, if you're a Kiwi and you want to trade Facebook, you, you click buy, and it may well go through to an exchange, but you need to do a foreign exchange deal. My company has that capability. My company has the capability to make you an options price or a share price or an index price when those markets are closed. So it's all about service and availability. So if you're sitting, for example, if something nasty happens overnight anywhere in the world and you're short gold and you need to cover your gold position, you would come to a company like us because we can price off of futures, we can fight, price off a of second tier market. So I think if you are an online stockbroker, what, do you, what are commissions now? I mean, zero. How do people make money? In the US, they sell the retail flows on to market makers. We're a market maker. We're also a broker. We can be whatever you want to be. But unless you've got the capability to make markets, because people are not going to wait for the US to open to get out of a position. And I think that's the differentiator, because technology now is available to everybody. Uh, you can get platforms. There's a couple of good companies here that write technology. But bolting on 
the execution and the clearing and the technology and the pricing and the aggregation, there's, no one can take that out. And that's what we've been doing. When you look at finance more broadly, obviously, yeah. as you've mentioned, technology opened so many doors for yeah, yeah. a lot of people. What are the inefficiencies you see today? Who's still yet to undercut? Well, it's pretty rock bottom. I mean, you know, if I, I actually said to somebody the other day, if, if somebody was to sit down and write a business plan to try and create my company, CMC Markets, from scratch today, the business plan wouldn't hold up because you'd say, well, you know, we have to give zero commissions on shares and we have to give really tight pricing on foreign exchange and we have to give straight through processing to you know, certain exchanges and clearing and stuff like that. The only way you can really make money out of this industry now is through scale. Mm, volume of active customers. Absolutely. So we, for example, don't make on every transaction. We hope to make overall over a period of time. But we have one and a half million clients globally. And some of them want to trade out of Australia, out of Singapore, out of New Zealand. They want to trade foreign exchange. They want to trade overseas shares. We make our money somewhere amongst the fog of all of that. It's very transparent. I don't mean we're making it through the back door. But if you do something that's outside of your country, then an opportunity exists for us to make a, a small amount of commission. And, you know, we'll turn over two, three, four hundred thousand trades a day, 10, 20 billion dollars worth of turnover. And amongst that, there are some opportunities for us just to take the spread. That's all we're looking for, because if you try to take more than the spread, if you start to skew pricing, you get found out very quickly. Transparency is everywhere. So you can't really justify starting today in this industry. You need scale. And thank God we did it. I started it 33 years ago and we got scale. So your total addressable market is effectively dependent on encouraging more people to invest or existing investors to invest more, correct? What do you view the greatest risk to yeah. that is? Is it volatility or is there something else? So it's not just my company that wants individuals to trade more, it's governments. Governments can't afford welfare now and they can't afford pensions and they want to spend their money in areas that are important like education, like hospitals. So what we're seeing all around the world, but you know, the UK is one of them, you get tax breaks to invest your money in long-term pension plans and you know, capital gains free investments like ISIS, uh, like SIPs, uh, there's a super superannuation type things that you get down here. And you're able then to extract cash out of your pension pot tax-free, a percentage of that. So governments are encouraging individuals to invest their money for the future because they don't want individuals to be de dependent upon them. Commercial property in the UK, you can put into your pension plan. You can't put domestic property in there at the moment. That would be nice. It would be nice if they abolished inheritance tax uh, in the UK as well. It doesn't raise that much money, but it's politically uh, not it's a hot potato politically. Um, but so governments want you as individuals to take control of your personal finances. And that puts us in pole position, companies like us, to sort of get a lot of business from individuals. Um, so uh, I've forgotten your question, actually. Unless My I question was, what do you think the biggest risk to, to that is, to a growing investor market? Is it volatility? I, I don't think... Uh, the systemic risk from, you know, governments. And I think it's individual risk because nowadays it's so competitive and countries around the world, they want you to trade stocks and shares for whatever reason. They, some governments claim stamp duty. Um, what I've seen in Europe is that financial services is quite well, well regulated. The failure of firms is much harder following the global economic crisis. I think it boils down to individual risk. I mean, you, you, know, you don't want to see people lose 50% of their pensions on you know, bad investments. 
Um, and so it's, the regulator is very tight in Europe. They protect, and there's these financial compensation schemes that we all chip into every year. So it's about individual losses, I think, more than anything. So is the greatest risk then that while investing has become easier and more encouraged, we haven't actually gotten much better at it? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it gets confusing because you have a lot of low-valued retail investors that are just sort of starting on their journey. But especially in this office here in New Zealand, the, uh, the investors here are quite savvy. And, and I think it's a journey that people go on. So net, net, net overall, I would say, yeah, people do struggle. They get excited. Everybody was excited by Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And then we had GameStop and stuff. And uh, they all got excited. They piled in. And of course, that was a disaster uh, or volatile. And some, you have to separate out some things from investing and gambling. You know, to me, cryptocurrencies are not, they're not connected to any economy per se. They, they try to make them say like they're part of the blockchain mm -hmm. thing, but we don't really talk about blockchain now. It doesn't seem to be coming through. But, um, and they could never be, in my opinion, this is not advice, but I don't think a cryptocurrency could ever be a fiat currency. No central bank would allow a currency outside of their control to be used inside their country unless it was sort of individual companies accepting them. Do you not foresee central banks coming out with CBDC, yes. central bank digital yes. currency? I think, think there's a future for that? Yeah, in okay. fact, when Rishi Sunak was uh, chancellor, uh, I said to him, wouldn't it be great if you had a digital currency and you could claim VAT real time? So when you go into a restaurant, and, uh, and by the way, just to go, we'll come back on digital currency. I'm, I'm all for it because I, I pay all my taxes. I've got nothing to hide. I don't care, you know. I'm happy. But um, the thing is, the distinction with, say, something like cryptocurrencies, it's gambling. You think all crypto trading is gambling? I think so. I think you have to define it as gambling. Then why does CMC allow crypto trading on its platform? Well, we allow, you know, gambling or we have a spread bet platform in the UK. You can trade it, but as long as you understand, it's not for us to take judgment on people's investment ideas. We just make a little bit of brokerage or you know, spread, not on every transaction. It's up to the individual and taking back to your question as it become more difficult. I think it's getting a bit foggy around what's investing and what's gambling. Cryptos to me are gambling. Are there any other assets that you think sit further on that gambling spectrum than investing? Well, sports, but we don't offer that. Um, any other asset class um, or just crypto? Yeah, I think some highly leveraged ETFs could be gambled. And if, it, it's, if you've got anything that's really highly leveraged, then that could, that's not sort of investing so much. It's almost like gambling. Um, but, you know, if you, if you want to buy the S&P or the DAX, or if you want to uh, invest in Facebook long term or Tesla, and there's volatility there, you know. But, um, yeah, so I'd separate the two. I was going to ask you about all of these investment trends, but you've gone there already on crypto, ETFs, so tick tick on both of those. I want to ask you about another acronym, and I want your yay or nay on it, and then your explanation. ESG? If you tell, turn the camera off, I'll tell you what I think about ESG. I but, told you there's uh, no rules on this program, so oh, it's really? free run. Okay. So I said to uh, Lucinda on holiday, I said, you know, because um, she's quite passionate, as all young people are. And she said to me, uh, you know, this global warming. I said, do you know what, Lucinda? I said, if Britain tomorrow goes carbon neutral overnight and all petrol emission cars, carbon emission cars are stopped, it will make no difference to global warming because we are 0. point blah, blah, blah of global warming. When you have China, Russia and India contributing 70% of carbon emissions. Unless they fall in line, then whatever we do is a complete waste of time. And of course, her natural reaction was that, well, we, you know, we have to, it has to start somewhere and we could be the lead in all of this. And I said, yeah, but the cost 
of doing that, the energy bills that would go up, will not hit you or me, because if you get an energy bill and you said, Dad, it's gone up by all of this money, I'd be quite, she can pay for herself, she's self-sufficient, but I'd be quite happy to give you that money. It won't affect our lives. But the poor people lower down the food chain that are trying to survive, and they get an extra two, three, four thousand pounds a year, just so we can get a 0.25 global emissions reduction it's, it's, very, it's very bad on them. If you don't mind me saying, you sound a lot like Rishi Sunak. Hmm. Well, uh, good luck to him then. He's been taking my advice, no doubt. But, um, well, no, Boris Johnson brought in this. I mean, what he's done is he deferred, deferred the carbon emission vehicle, you know, zero carbon emissions from 2030, I think, to 2035. And that caused a lot of upset, but he hasn't stopped it. I, I'm not saying, I'm not criticising him. Uh, but I'm just saying that um, until the major powers like Russia and uh, China and the US and South America do more, then whatever we do in Britain is a waste of time. ESG investing more broadly, do you think that's a waste of time? Um, ESG, I mean, ESG investing um, is really a lifestyle choice to a certain degree because not all SG, ESG compliant comes generally, and we'll, I mean, I haven't got enough research, generally they have to reduce profits to meet ESG targets. So if you're looking for a pure investment return, you may not look at that type of company. But um, so it would be a personal lifestyle choice. That's fine. I'm not saying that's wrong. But um, I think if you're looking for long term good investments, then I think you need to separate it out and see what it's costing companies to be ESG compliant um, and say to yourself, well, do I want to make money or do I want to be a good citizen or do I want to be both? And if you want to be a good citizen, it's probably going to cost you investment income at some stage because companies are spending huge amounts of money on being in ESG compliance, which means a reduction in their profits. And that's, it's, you know, this is the real world we're talking about now. I'm not some fuzzy politician that's trying to say the right thing at the right time to the right people and win votes. This is the real world. What I, I'm a businessman, okay? The most important thing to me, I employ 1,300 people globally, um, and we turn over four trillion pounds worth of business every year. The most important thing to those individuals is that they have a paycheck at the end of the month. Another acronym, AI, do you think that artificial intelligence and its impact on finance is going to cause some of those employees to possibly lose their paychecks? When I launched internet trading back in October 1996, I had 30 to 35 people working for me. Most of the business was done on phone, phones and uh, my traders, were nervous that they would lose their jobs. And in fact, a few left because they were against the internet because they felt it was going to replace them. 1,300 people later, uh, 14 offices around the world listed on the UK stock exchange. Um, you know, one and a half million clients. I think that had the opposite effect. So I think what it will do, artificial intelligence will make companies more efficient. Uh, more profitable because there'll have to be consolidation, but um, it will drive down the cost of everything in terms of financial services and make us all better. Um, we'll see. Your platform CMC largely offers what's called derivative trading, like contracts for difference, CFDs and spread bidding. One could say the slightly more speculative type of investment. If you could go long or short on something right now, what would it be? So, first of all, okay, it's important for your listeners and viewers to understand that a CFD, a spread bet, is not a product, it's a settlement term. And if, so, for example, if you, if you wanted to trade Facebook, and I've used that a lot, I don't know why, but anyway, if you wanted to trade Facebook, it doesn't matter if you trade it through an ETF, a physical share, an option, a spread bet, or a CFD, 
The strike price is the underlying share price. It's the same. Everything else is a settlement. Term. The ASX 200 is a contract for difference. Why? Because although it's traded on the futures exchange, the Dow Jones Index, the S&P 500, the DAX, the CAC Caron, when they mature, you can't own a fraction of a share through the index. So the ASX 200 is a compilation of 200 shares. You trade it as a future. When the futures price expires, you reverse out the position and you pay and receive the profit or the loss. So all of these are settlement terms. Um, and you don't have to leverage up. I mean, you, you can use a CFD. A spread bet is a CFD. There's no capital gains tax on it. It's just the same. But the underlying strike price is the same. We call it a bet. It's not a bet because we don't determine the odds. Facebook is where it is. You know, Tesla is where it is. And, um, but you just trade it in a way that you avoid capital gains tax. The government love it. You're not, we're not circumventing anything. They get a, a transactional tax every month. Um, so really, you, you know, what you should do is focus on the underlying product you want to trade and then choose your wrapper, your settlement wrapper. And, um, and then that way, approach it that way. And if you want to leverage, if you want to do stock lending or stock, you know, borrow to buy uh, investments, then you can use a CFD for leverage. You don't have to have 10 times leverage, 20 times leverage. You can actually have one or two times leverage. Just top your account up. If you want to do a 100,000 uh, Kiwi dollar deal, put in 50,000 and then you keep the position. If you were to do a one hundred thousand dollar Kiwi deal today yes. and go yes. long or short, what would you go long or short? I on? think if I, if I was to look across the financial markets at the moment, you're looking very uh, interested in what I've got to say. First of all, I'm pretty crap at investing. That's why I just invest in CMC. I don't sell shares. I just keep reinvesting. If you look at the forward multiples of the FTSE one hundred, they are dire compared to the US. The US is double. Well, I would buy I would buy a FTSE tracker fund. Okay. I'm not giving financial advice. I'm no, I'm just interested to know your thoughts. Yeah, I would probably buy a FTSE tracker because I think the valuations in the UK are pretty poor and not really justifiable. But um, that's probably what I would do. But you'd have to hang on to it. Medium term, I guess. Speaking of what you'd probably do, if you don't mind me asking, yeah. you started CMC, you're still the CEO today. Right. Yeah. Do you think you'll remain as the CEO for a long time? What are your thoughts on how long you may be operational in this company? Uh, indefinitely. I have no succession planning. My kids have got no interest in coming into the business. Um, no succession plan. Got a great team. If I get run over by a bus tomorrow, which is unlikely because I drive a Rolls Royce, but anyway. Um, there's infrastructure there to carry on. If you think of our office in New Zealand, our office in Australia, Singapore, they're all independent local companies run by locals. So operationally, things would carry on. I'm the ideas guy. I come up with the vision. I come up with a strategy. I love that part of it. It's not actually that hard for me to carry on working. The official line is that I'm going to work for the next 10 years. The unofficial line is I'm going to work for the next 20 years. So you they're not getting rid of me yet. Lovely to share with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your Prattis. time, Madison. Enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Now, Peter obviously has views on UK politics, but if you want to hear about those, you'll have to find them somewhere else. And if you're wondering what his watch was, it's a Patek Philippe, platinum. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.